Hello, I'm Carolyn Kinane with the Contemplative Sciences Center at the University of Virginia. And this is the um, fourth in a series of eight videos on contemplative course design. Please make sure you've at least viewed the first one before jumping to this one. So from the community of inquiry framework, you may already have or you are thinking about developing activities to increase social students' social presence in online classes. Again, that's the community of inquiry framework. And many of those activities, in addition to increasing students' social presence in online classes, also pay attention to the inner world of students and invite the whole self, the self beyond the academic, into the learning space. Such activities can also demonstrate care and cultivate awareness. And so, for example, you can start class with a ritual of silence, perhaps a one-word check-in, and these do a few things. It helps myself and my students bring awareness to the fact that we are here and not there, coming into shared space and time together. It also gives me, as an instructor, a sense of the room. It helps students not just feel seen, but actually be seen. And it's also a chance for students to follow up with one another if they wish. So, you know, I heard you say at the start of class that you're stressed, what's on your mind? This is also an opportunity for inquiry. We could have that one word check-in be uh, an inquiry into folks' value or desire or intention for how they want to be in shared space together. Another activity that I like to do, I call check your bags. It's a kind of brain dump. So um, it acknowledges that we all come into spaces with things on our minds and it might be helpful to shine a light on it and be intentional about checking our bags at the door, about putting our baggage uh, aside, bringing awareness to what we're carrying, set it down, inquire into an intention, and bring presence into our time together. Another activity for social presence is contemplative listening, which also builds empathy, which informs actions in the world. And I'd like to pause for a moment on this idea of action, because a common critique of the mindfulness movement and uh, contemplative movements is that they are focused on the self, that they're focused on meditating away worries and reducing stress without doing anything to transform the toxic systems or environments that it may be creating or contributing to the stress. And I hope as I've already made clear that the purpose for me of contemplation is transformation. Transformation of habitual ways of knowing and being and doing, and this is transformation that shows up in the world. The affective realm and attention to states of mind or consciousness, the ability to adopt a disposition, these elements impact behavior. And please forgive the long quotation, but I think it is worth it. So focusing on the affective dimension of learning is also a crucial element in developing critical thinking. Bastian and others identified that critical thinking has two dimensions, cognitive skills and affective dispositions, such as honesty in facing one's own biases, prejudices, stereotypes, and egocentric or sociocentric tendencies, trust in the process of reasoned inquiry, open-mindedness, and open-mindedness concerning divergent worldviews. These ideas focus on the potential for higher education to be transformative and not merely vocational. Marizo defines transformative learning as, quote, learning that transforms problematic frames of reference, sets of fixed assumptions and expectations, habits of mind, meaning perspectives, mindsets, to make them more inclusive, discriminating, open, reflective, and emotionally able to change. So contemplative pedagogy recognizes the powerful role of affective states, dispositions, and habits of mind for ethical action. I find it is difficult to fact someone into changing their mind. Course content alone is not enough, which is why at the Contemplative Sciences Center, we focus on offering students experiences, exercises, and practices that bring attention to their assumptions and habits, invite inquiry, and provide space for reflection, and so on. So while a first step might be bringing awareness to habitual ways of being, a next step might be building students and my own capacities for empathetic engagement. One of the things that was important to me is that students do more than just learn about different philosophies, but explore their own attitudes to the environment from both effective, contemplative, and relational perspectives. I was inspired by Arthur Zion's idea of an epistemology of love rather than an epistemology of separation. Zion argues that our modern epistemological emphasis on objectification predisposes us to an instrumental and manipulative way of being in the world, also characterized by disidentification with others, resulting in a loss of empathy and a sense of disconnection from other humans in the environment. He calls for an intentional cultivation of more empathetic relationships 
with these others and sees contemplative practice as an important part of this project. This has implications for affecting more concern for justice in our communities. Studies have shown that empathetic concern is positively correlated with pro-social behavior and justice motivation. And so one practice to encourage empathetic engagement is deep listening. You can find many variations of this practice on our website and elsewhere online. I'll present one version of it that I like right here. So here I ask students to write for a moment, what is something mildly annoying that happened in the past 48 hours? Not anything too major, just a small annoyance that you are willing to share. And what is something that has brought you joy in the past 48 hours? Again, not anything too major, just a simple delight that you're willing to share. Then partner one speaks for three minutes while, part, while the other partner listens. There's a 30 second pause. Partner two speaks for three minutes while their partner listens. There's a 30 second pause. And then a three minute debrief before rejoining the group for a full debrief. And there's many variations on this. You can change the prompt. You can change the amount of time. You can um, change what the partner does. You can, do the, can they respond um, in any way with body language? Or do they need to stay perfectly still? So this Exercise brings attention to habits. Um, I can listen in such a way that I am bringing awareness to my habits, to what I am usually doing when I listen, and I can also practice humility and curiosity. Now, people have a variety of responses to this exercise, and for me, I have found that it often surfaces the idea that people listen with all kinds of unexamined intentions to fix, to problem solve, to sound smart, to connect and be likable. So. It brings awareness to people's habits. I want to interrupt. I want to connect. I want to explain. I want to solve, and so on. But it also releases the listener from the obligation of having to fix or to perform. And it helps the listener practice not knowing. Rather than asking leading questions, they can listen for genuine questions. So this exercise can be framed so that students are helping someone come to their own wisdom or framed so that students come to see the world a little bit different, a little bit as another might see it. I also like this prompt because it gives me a chance to um, bring up the idea of a negativity bias. I have found that folks pretty much have no problem thinking about something mildly annoying that has happened in the past 48 hours, but I've found people need a little bit of time to think about something delightful that has happened in the past 48 hours. So linking the prompt to some course content can be helpful too. There are many other exercises to build empathetic engagement and perspective taking. This is just one, and I hope it inspires you to develop some more activities to cultivate the contemplative pause and to use contemplation in service of ethical action. Thank you.